Hi everyone, today I'd like to talk through the mechanism for a diastereoselective aldol reaction. I'll be showing how we can use boron Lewis acids to selectively enolize a ketone, and then I'll be reacting the enolate with an aldehyde using the zinnemann traxler model to impart diastereoselectivity. If you like the video, please do consider giving it a like and subscribing to my channel if you want to hear more things along these lines. Okay then, this is the reaction scheme I'd like to talk through today. Um, so I'm starting off on the left-hand side with a ketone, and I'm going to treat it with this cyclohexyl boron chloride and triethylamine combo to form this enolate species in the middle and to form this E enolate. Now the E is always defined by relative to the oxygen, so this methyl group is trans, and that's how we define our two high priority groups. And then if I treat this enolate with an aldehyde, so I'm just going to use benzaldehyde here as an example, I will end up with the 1,2-anti-diastereomer as my product. So I get this diastereomer, but it will of course be racemic as there's no enantioinduction in this reaction scheme. Now to start with the enolization process, it's quite important now that this R group is reasonably big compared to the methyl group, so we're talking isopropyl or bigger. This is a key control element for this pretty bulky Lewis acid that we're going to use in this reaction. So just drawing it out there, we've got two secondary alkyl groups on that boron center, and the chloride is a sort of reasonably decent leaving group, but not fantastic. So the first step of the mechanism is going to be coordination of this boron center to the lone pairs on the ketone. Now, when we do this, if you have an sp2 oxygen, we're going to prefer to want to keep the big bulky boron thing on the opposite side to the R group. So initially in equilibrium, we're going to form this activated complex. Now we might have noticed in this reaction, we've actually got quite a weak base here. And so the triethylamine can't deprotonate the initial ketone in this position here. But now that we've activated the carbonyl, this proton is now much more acidic in the activated complex. So now the triethylamine can come along to tautomerize this from the keto form to the enol form. But there's a cunning piece of diastereoselectivity going on in this deprotonation. There are of course two protons on that carbon. But to understand how we get the E enolate out of this, we need to think about the orbitals that are involved. So specifically, the sigma electrons in this CH sigma bond are going to be transferred into the pi star of the carbonyl bond. Now it's critical that that CH sigma bond is lined up perfectly with the pi star of the carbonyl. And the way to achieve that is for the CH to be pointing sort of perpendicular to the plane of the page. So if I were to draw it in 3D like this, um, I can see that I've got an overlap with the pi star of the carbonyl with the red CH sigma bond. So that's just the pi star at the back. So we can see that there's an overlap of the orbitals and it's all in phase, and this is a productive way forward for the deprotonation step. Now, one thing we might notice is that at the front, there appears to be a bit of a steric problem, that the Lewis acid is clashing quite a bit with that methyl group. But actually, if we think about it, that's not a problem here, as there was always another hydrogen we could deprotonate. And actually, we need to think about another complement to complete our analysis when we consider deprotonating this other hydrogen here. So in fact, these two protons are diastereotopic under the conditions of this reaction. So just taking a 120 degree rotation clockwise from my perspective, and moving the hydrogen up into the perpendicular reactive position, it's going to move the red hydrogen down to here, and the methyl group will end up down in this bottom left-hand corner. So these are the two reactive conformations. But just because they're the two reactive conformations doesn't mean that they're the most populated ones. In fact, we can notice down here that the steric clashing between the boron and the rest of the molecule is much smaller. So we'd expect them to be in equilibrium, but much more towards the one at the bottom here. And if we're at low temperature, we'd expect the bottom one to be far more populated. So we can see now if the triethylamine were to sneak in and deprotonate, the methyl group is quite a long way away from the oxygen. And so under kinetic control at low temperature, we will selectively form this particular geometry of enolate, so this is E, and the other product is a triethyl ammonium cation. Now if you're doing this reaction in a lab, you've probably picked your solvent cunningly because if the chloride leaves on the Lewis acid, and that's fine because the boron's unhappy, it's got a negative charge on a not particularly electronegative atom, you can precipitate out your triethylamine hydrochloride, and that will drive your reaction towards this nicely reactive cyclohexyl boron enolate. So in practice, say you've done this reaction in ether as a solvent, 
So you'll see a white precipitate forming when you know this reaction is working. If you're at not too dilute concentrations, this enolate is often yellow in colour, presumably because there's some sort of electron delocalization over the boron and the enolate components. And now we've got our reactive enolate in a flask and the byproduct has precipitated out so it doesn't participate in the rest of the reaction. We can add our aldehyde component. Now the thing that's cunning about these boron enolates is that there's actually still an empty orbital on the boron. So while it's still an enolate, it's also a Lewis acid at the boron, which means that we can also use it to activate the aldehyde component. So rather than like in a normal aldol reaction where you have an enolate attacking an aldehyde and it's an intermolecular reaction, by doing this pre-coordination, we can promote an intramolecular reaction. And the intramolecular reaction should be faster than any possible intermolecular reaction in the flask at the same time. So now we have another activated complex and we can see here that the reactive nucleophilic carbon of the enolate component of this is six atoms away from the electrophilic aldehyde carbon. And so our transition state for the reaction will be a six membered ring. The reaction itself will look something like this. And under kinetic control, we can have a think about what shape this transition state might be, but we'd expect the lowest energy of them to be a chair. And so under kinetic control, that will be the most populated conformation for the reaction. So I'm just going to try and draw this transition state as a chair. So that's the enolate at the back, and I'm just going to bolt on an aldehyde at the front. And this is the six membered ring that I'm going to try and represent. So there's two cyclohexyl groups left on that boron, and that's activating the system for us. There's an R group on the enolate, and that's staying sp2 all the way through, so that'll point off in this direction somewhere. There's a methyl group at the front, and that was always going to be trans to the oxygen and there's a hydrogen left on this carbon here. So the aldehyde has two choices for where it puts its groups. It's got a hydrogen or a phenol group, and the lower energy transition state will put the hydrogen in the axial position and the phenol group in the equatorial position. And that's for all the normal reasons to minimize one free diaxial strain. So overall, this is the lowest energy of the transition states. This is the so-called Zinnemann-Traxler model in action. Now for these particular reactions, the cyclohexyl group really comes into its own here because that being really big helps to differentiate the two possible transition states where the hydrogen and phenol groups could be in the opposite positions. And also this boron oxygen bond is pretty short because there's quite a high degree of covalent character there. So that will increase all the steric interactions and make sure that this is a transition state that the majority of the molecules go through. And now we can just check that that goes to my product. So it depends how good your 3D is here, but one way we can do this is to have a look at this little M shape in here in my product, just drawn in yellow, and try and find that in my structure. So I'm just gonna take a little side step down here. We'll do my reaction and have a look at what my product will be. Now, first following those arrows and that little yellow zigzag, I'm going to trace back to this alpha carbon, to this new carbonyl that's formed. We can see that the methyl group is pointing up here and it's definitely above the hydrogen. So I can insert the up methyl group in my product. We can do the same thing for the next stereocenter that's forming. The hydrogen is above the oxygen. So now we can see that that newly formed stereocenter has the oxygen going down as drawn. Okay, now we need to get rid of the boron bit, which is quite stuck onto the molecule as a bidentate chelate. And specifically, you'd normally do an oxidative workup for this. So that's using hydrogen peroxide. We normally need to buffer it a bit. So pH 7 buffer is quite common. And we normally use that in methanol. Those conditions will get rid of the boron for me into the aqueous layer and supply the proton that I need for my product. And now we can see that that product in black that I've just drawn there is just the rotated form of the final product at the top. So as ever with a diastereoselective transformation, being on top of your 3D drawing and using different models is key for success. And here we've used one carbon-carbon bond forming reaction to set two stereocenters at once. Okay, that's me done for today. If you enjoyed the video, do give it a like and consider subscribing to my channel. I intend to make some synthesis videos using this transformation in the future. So do keep an eye out for those.